Akio Jisoji is a name that fans of all sorts of Japanese cinema and television might recognize. Through a diverse and lengthy career of four decades, Jisoji created a name for himself as both a children's director and a master of Japanese art house. His career in cinema started with the Ultraman television series, where his stark artistic vision caught the attention of many. As the 1960s stretched on through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, Jisoji moved on to other special effects TV shows, namely more iterations of Ultraman and a number of film adaptations. Many of these adaptations came from novels by Edogawa Rampo, while perhaps the most notable was the first Teito Monogatari film. From the time of Ultra 7, Akio Jisoji worked with Godzilla special effects master Eiji Tsuburaya on his early Ultraman projects. Following these early shows, Jisoji delved into abstract filmmaking courtesy a massively influential independent film studio, the Art Theater Guild. Jisoji's introduction to ATG came in the form of his directorial work on a short film based upon a script by Nagisa Oshima, a director we've covered several times on this channel. Throughout his lengthy, varied career, Akio Jisoji covered a myriad of different subjects. He entertained and challenged audiences in equal measure, seeming to do whatever he pleased as a filmmaker. Unfortunately, Jisoji passed away in 2006 of stomach cancer. Within the body of work Jisoji left behind, two qualities seem to remain consistent in spite of these various changing undercurrents. Artistic vision, that is, how he represents the visual space, and uniqueness of expression, that being the subjects Jisoji approached and the manner in which he did so. Both of these qualities are on full display in the film we'll be discussing today. The Buddhist Trilogy is a set of films released between 1970 and 1972, all financed by and co-produced with Art Theater Guild alongside Jisoji's own independent production house. Viewers will remember ATG as the studio which helped produce films like Nagisa Oshima's Death by Hanging, and Kiju Yoshida's Heroic Purgatory and Kudeta. Respectively, each piece of the Buddhist trilogy comprises ATG's 12th, 16th, and 22nd films. The studio's other output has anything to say about these three, one shouldn't expect the flashy special effects of Jisoji's earlier works. Each of the films examines contemporary Japanese life through a Buddhist lens, and each film, in its own way, utilizes religious iconography to explore questions about taboo, humanity, existence, love, sex, life, faith, morality, ethics, and a host of minor themes which provide the trilogy with a rich sense of realism and humanity. However, we have elected not to look at the Buddhist trilogy as a whole in one video. Each film is hugely different in terms of underlying messages and interests, and we feel as though they would be ill-served to be covered all at once. They might share visual similarities, but each of these films, This Transient Life, Mandala, and Poem, all have their own message. What's more, this trilogy has an unofficial fourth installment that we plan on covering in a few months. About a year ago, Arrow Video was set to release the Buddhist trilogy in the United States and the United Kingdom. Close to the set's street date, however, the company put out a press statement, stating that they were unable to procure high enough quality prints of one or more of the films. In keeping with their desire to release films with high picture grades, Arrow simply didn't feel comfortable with what they had available at the time. Given the year-long delay, Arrow elected to add a fourth film as something of an apology, providing us with 1974's It Was a Faint Dream. Yet another film from Jisoji focused heavily on Buddhist iconography, with its own spiritual and temporal take on the world. This film, coupled with the high picture quality of all four, and the booklet containing various essays in the Buddhist trilogy, make Arrow's set a worthwhile investment for anyone interested in early 70s Japanese art house, or the long, strange career of this often overlooked director. With that being said, let's jump right into the first film of the trilogy. Certainly not the most impenetrable of the lot, but easily one of the most fascinating, and released in 1970, let us present to you This Transient Life. The cast of This Transient Life is, relatively speaking, small. Essentially, the film revolves around an upper-class family living in a massive estate in the Japanese suburbs. The parents are barely in the picture, with This Transient Life instead focusing primarily on the son, Masao, and the daughter, Yuri, 
two adult children who seemingly don't have much to do with their lives. Masao is a pseudo-intellectual who rejects his father's urging that he go to university, while Yuri is given barely any perceivable motivation for life, other than to get married. Additionally, we follow Ogino, a monk at a local Buddhist temple, Iwashita, one of the servants of Masao and Yuri's family, a woodcarver with whom Masao wants to apprentice, and lastly, the carver's son, who wishes to enter further education in order to escape his father's austere life. This transient life explores the interpersonal relationships between the whole group, though ultimately the most important relationship here is that between Masao and Yuri. For that reason, we'll be exploring their relationship above all the others, as it is from their interactions that the majority of the film's themes and messages spring. Without beating around the bush any further, this explosive yet understated beginning to Akiyoji Soji's film career is effectively a story about a young man, Masao, who feels emotionally and sexually for his sister. Of the laundry list we rattled off earlier, this transient life is primarily concerned with questioning life, human existence, taboo, and societal norms. These themes are questioned through juxtaposition in both the visual and thematic spaces. Namely, we observe early on how Masao wants to avoid at all costs attending university. His father insists that Masao become an educated adult to provide for the next generation of their long-standing family, as evidenced by the presence of their family altar room. Masao is instead taken with the idea of becoming a Buddhist carving artist's apprentice, in whose artwork Masao sees a true existential purpose. This is further explored through Masao's foil, the carver's son, who himself wants to go to university. Getting back to the crux of the film, Masao finds purpose in two things. His new passion for artistic output, and perhaps more importantly, the sexual frustration he feels towards his sister. This frustration is shown when Masao compares his life to that of a soldier, saying that he pours all of his being into the Kanon statue he helps the master carve in order to hone his craft. As we see on at least one occasion, these interests overlap, showing us that the artistic release could be serving the dual purpose of allowing Masao a sexual release. It's a moderately ambiguous, ironically almost frustrating look at what social taboo can create within the people who experience disallowed desires, which comes to define this transient life without ever providing us any satisfactory answers on what is objectively right or wrong. The first encounter between Masao and Yuri evolves from a children's game which Masao uses as an in to present his feelings for his sister. Reminiscing on earlier days, the two compare themselves to their parents, as Masao retrieves a pair of no masks. These masks belong to their parents and appear to have an amount of nostalgic clout for the kids, who use the masks to play and chase one another in a childish manner. Quickly, the encounter turns into a full-on assault, with Masao viscerally presenting Yuri with his lust. We as an audience understand, given their familial relation, that this is an uncomfortable situation. But it's in the framing of the encounter that we see a new dimension highlighted. The encounter occurs in the room of the house containing the portraits of the family's elders, as well as the shrine to their ancestors. This visual brings home that, even in private, we feel the effects of social taboo, which is perhaps the primary point of this transient life, to question how taboo affects us as members of social groups. Beyond this initial stark scene, the film approaches the morality of social taboo in a very blunt manner. Masao's interest in his sister isn't written off easily, nor is it shown in a positive light. Instead, the film presents the subject of incest without condemnation nor bolstering, examining what it says about Masao. The film thus doesn't claim to be an arbiter of morality or ethics. Instead, it merely presents the events occurring between brother and sister, as well as their causes and effects. In turn, this transient life takes on an almost documentary style in allowing the audience to draw their own conclusions. In fact, through this hands-off approach to morality, we observe that Masao's view of his sister is not completely steady. We see this first during one encounter where he envisions her as a skeleton bearing a no-mask. Masao is shown here to feel some sort of disgust or repulsion towards Yuri, or his own ancestors. 
Yet, in spite of this, he continues pursuing their relationship. You've probably noticed that we've almost entirely talked about the film's narrative and themes from the perspective of Masao, which may imply that Yuri is a character utterly lacking in agency. This is due to the fact that, save for a few examples which we'll get to soon, the film itself primarily follows Masao, and seems to be purposefully ignoring Yuri's part in the story up to a point. We're concerned with Masao's selfishness primarily, which comes to a head at the next narrative fold. The relationship between Masao and Yuri is further complicated by her pregnancy under the watchful eye of the ancestors. At the announcement of her pregnancy with her brother's child, we return to the image of the couple's ancestors bearing down on them. They know the children's misconduct, even if no one else but us might. This whole series of events was a fling for Masao, a fling which Yuri rejected at first before folding and accepting. Only now are the stakes much higher. It's at this point that Yuri attempts to regain some sense of agency, again further complicating the issue. Soon after discovering her pregnancy, Yuri loses faith in their love affair, claiming that she'll commit suicide to finish off her life and that of their child. Masao robs her of her agency once again, stating that she's scared rather than serious. He is effectively mocking her, telling her that she doesn't have control over her own destiny, that she ought to bring the child to term rather than committing suicide and raising questions as to Masao's culpability in her death. It may be socially taboo and potentially a health hazard to have this child, but it's worth it if Masao isn't inconvenienced and is allowed to continue as he wishes. In fact, while Yuri struggles to come to grips with her future, Masao's selfish nature sees him returning to his veritable cave, where he can continue carving his Kanon statues. Having become the dutiful artisan's apprentice, Masao plugs away at his work. At the same time, Masao can't completely ignore his sister's pregnancy. The taboo must be covered up, and Yuri is soon betrothed to one of the family's servants, Iwashita, who we affectionately nicknamed Farmhand Bill, given that his name is barely ever mentioned. In turn, we see that Masao is a jealous boy, leading him to further rob Yuri of her agency by playing their father's prejudices against the new couple. Before long, due to disagreements between the family, Yuri and her husband are separated. Masao, a hedonist, offers his view on life at this point. If we just do what pleases us, everything will turn out fine. This statement turns out to be patently false, given how much these characters struggle in spite of Masao's pursuit of personal pleasure. Given the size of their house and the existence of others within it, Masao's family is clearly well off, perhaps leading us to ask whether those more privileged in society are more likely to lead down these taboo paths. Taboos must be continually escalated in Masao's case in order to keep the excitement going, with the two moving eventually from having sex in front of their ancestors to having sex in a graveyard, desecrating the graves of people they never knew. Through these continued transgressions, we see how their interactions ripple out and affect others. The local temple's monk, Ogina, explains at one point how Masao misuses the Buddha's teachings in order to feed his own hedonism. This serves, in a way, to present us with the ultimate issue for Masao. He sees the world around him, the characters and social mechanisms, as a set of tools to use for his own pleasure. He has no real interest in their value as people, either disregarding their issues in the case of his father, or completely invalidating their wants and needs, in the cases of Yuri, Ogina, and Farmhand Bill. By proxy, we see Masao's taboo through the eyes of others, namely Ogina, who around the time of calling Masao a hedonist, witnesses the brother and sister in the bushes by the temple he oversees. Ogina, though he shames Masao, in turn projects Yuri's visage onto the goddess of mercy Kanon, the very image Masao has been carving throughout the film. In spite of his training and sense of moral and spiritual superiority, the monk himself is liable to lapse into taboo. His own desires make us ask that if the sanctity of religion cannot prevent these lapses, who might be safe from dark desires? Are taboos appealing on a basic human level and sworn off for the sake of collective societal advancement? Or are they more appealing to people like the monk due to their forsaken nature? Does society, by banning taboos, make us want to explore dicey topics, in which we otherwise wouldn't hold any interest? Ordinary folk like Farmhand Bill are given to these lapses as well. Before their untimely betrothal, we observe Billy Boy checking out Yuri in the bath, before returning to his room and showing violent tendencies against naughty pictures. 
when their marriage is announced. This lends the audience a sense of dread that neither Masao nor Yuri are privy to. We are effectively taking on the role of their ancestors here, observing all the lewd acts occurring within the house, yet unable to tell the characters how unsafe they are. Outside of these observations from other, minor characters, this transient life has two further stylistic choices which help it explore taboo while tying it in with the other films from the Buddhist trilogy, those being Buddhist imagery and the film's style at large. The film presents Masao's and Yuri's taboo through the lens of Buddhist iconography, making us question how society affects our perception of taboo. By presenting us with imagery related to a deeply spiritual religion, this transient life further asks whether taboos are something we feel intrinsic repulsion towards, or whether said repulsion is something we learn from systems like religion or culture. Yuri travels between a set of Buddha footprints, a symbol that the Buddha was himself a real person who walked amongst non-Buddhas, reminding us that we can all become Buddhas with time and study. The characters invoke the five Buddhist sins, though admittedly they're left relatively unexplained. Masao and his masters spend the better part of their shared screen time carving a Kanon statue, the image of a goddess of mercy who can protect a number of different groups, including the pregnant, the aged, and those seeking mercy and guidance at large. Ogina is shown later praying to Kanon, thus displaying his reverence to this merciful goddess. The extremely minimal soundtrack sounds like something you might expect from a Buddhist concert or temple. Throughout this transient life, we see this Buddhist iconography suffused, all shown in a stark, avant-garde manner which would come to define the Buddhist trilogy. Akio Jisoji tends throughout the film to use lengthy tracking shots and an abundance of Dutch angles. The film itself is shot in black and white, which could be due to the film's budget, given that it was an independent project in an era of Japanese film where this market was just emerging. Or it could be Jisoji intending to show us the moral ambiguity of the actions on screen. The extremes are black and white, but everything that occurs in between are innumerable shades of grey, which is where the story itself occurs. For the most part, this transient life has a remarkable lack of dialogue with a ton of minimal music played over otherwise silent scenes. Rather than having everything spelled out through verbal interactions, we are delivered the emotional narrative of the film through facial expressions and insinuated meaning through framing. From time to time, we are subject to the stark juxtaposition of temple life and modern life. The family's estate has clearly been in the possession of their peoples for generations, as shown by the aged style and grandeur of the house in which they live. Presenting most of the film here effectively distances the viewer from the subject, implying that what we're observing is in the past, only to subversively remind us that this is our own world. We're looking at a pocket of society which coexists with all the modern industrial, economic, and social issues of 1970s Japan. Though this particular visual quirk might not reappear within later films in the trilogy, we believe that it embodies the issue at work within Masao's worldview. He is the product of a privileged group, a wealthy family surviving the only way they know how into modern times. He has little interest in anyone or anything outside of their insulated world. He has nothing to do but to pursue his own interests, and he has no reason to do otherwise. This is all presented before the backdrop of faith and modernity, two commonalities that would reappear in both follow-up films within Akio Jisoji's Buddhist trilogy. Despite the darkness of this chapter in Jisoji's first major solo outing as a director, it may surprise you to learn that this would not be the bleakest of the three films. If you haven't already, be sure to take a look at the Buddhist trilogy before next month. Come October, we'll be looking at the second film, Mandala, released one year after this transient life, which may legitimately have been one of the most awkward watches we've had yet on this channel. Be sure to tune in then, and let us know what you think of these three films in the comments below.